Good morning to those of you joining and logging on right now. We will be starting in just a couple of minutes as we see um, attendees joining as, um, as I speak right now. So we'll give it just a couple more minutes. Well, hello and good morning. I hope everybody's having a great day so far. Um, welcome to the Texas Industry Partnership Foundations Roundtable. Ooh, that was a, a mouthful. Um, glad I got through it. Um, my name is Mary York and I am the Division Director for Outreach and Employer Initiatives, sometimes called OEI, here at the Texas Workforce Commission. Um, thank you so much for joining us um, this morning. I think the first thing, um, I'm gonna kick us off by sharing the agenda. Um, it, you know, it's, it's gonna be a pretty, pretty simple, but um, we're gonna give a brief overview of that of the OEI division. And then Commissioner Demerson is gonna kick things off and speak to the purpose of this round table. And then we're gonna go into an overview of the reason why we're here, the Texas Industry Partnership Program. Um, followed by a discussion with our panelists. And these are the folks who really um, know the, the ins and outs. Um, they have participated in the program and um, know what it can do for the communities of Texas. So, and then we'll have an opportunity to end with a Q&A um, from the audience via the Zoom chat. So um, let's start with that, that quick overview of outreach and employer initiatives. So we have five different departments um, and they are business and education grants, campaigns and creative content, um, communications, um, education outreach, and the one that we're here gonna, we're gonna be focusing on today, um, employer engagement and community outreach. Um, and, and I think you'll probably picked up on the thread. All of those different departments are focused on sharing information um, about what it is that um, the, the importance of the Texas workforce and how TWC is here to support that along with our 28 board um, partners through workforce solutions throughout the state. So um, as we talk about employer engagement and community outreach, um, that is a department managed by Christy Cavanis, who I'm sure many of you have met. Um, and they work with a lot of the programs that you may have heard of, like our, our skills development fund, um, skills for small business, self-sufficiency fund, high demand job training, and then of course the one that we're here to talk about today, um, the Texas Industry Partnership Program, and we're gonna hear some more details on that shortly. Um, but first, um, I have the pleasure of being able to introduce Commissioner Aaron Demerson. So, um, I can't imagine that there's anybody on the call who does not know who Commissioner Demerson is, but just a little bit of background. Um, he serves as the commissioner representing employers for the Texas Workforce Commission. Governor Abbott appointed him to the three member commission on August 20th, 2019. And in his role, um, he is a passionate, passionate advocate for more than 600,000 Texas employers and over 3 million small businesses. Um, I think, you know, as, as you've interacted with him or his team, you know that they're devoted to serving as that first line of resources for Texas employers. I mean, you know, they have a hotline set up. Um, people are contacting them day in and day out with questions to ensure that those businesses get the support that they need. Um, 
He's also devoted to supporting the economic development and education that helps advance the skilled workforce that Texas needs to continue to be the top state for business. Um, we know that, you know, if we can help our workforce be successful and get the skills they need, that supports our businesses in Texas. And when those businesses, businesses succeed, Texas succeeds. So um, without further ado, welcome, Commissioner. All right, let me, I know it seems like I've, I've passed the first test, I believe. I actually uh, I now have my um, mic unmuted and my video on as well. And I hope we're, we're live and, and in person on the camera. See, I see that I'm there. You look great. You look great. All right, sounds like a plan. So great, greetings, greetings. I bring you greetings from the uh, beautiful city of Austin, Texas, the great state of Texas. And I want you to know our, in Texas, our economy is booming. Uh, Lake Todd and I are here in my office. We were just talking about the metaverse. And I mean, things are just uh, happening in big, big ways. Our unemployment rates continue to drop. Uh, we're fully recovered in a number of different areas uh, throughout our state in terms of the jobs that are out there. We've been named as the state of the decade, uh, doing things in, in big, big ways. Uh, the number one place for uh, to do business, uh, Governor's Cup for a number of years, over and over, years and years, the number one exporting state. And I could go on and on and on. Did I say that we are the state of the decade? Uh, there's a publication that kind of proves that. And as you all know, facts really matter. And Texas is doing some things in, in a big, big way. Uh, but if you heard me before, you know that uh, we all say in Texas, uh, it ain't bragging if it's true. You know, the facts of the matter is that we're taking care of business uh, in big, big ways. And we uh, couldn't do that without the support of folks uh, that, that are on this call today. Mary and her team are doing a phenomenal job and the foundations uh, that are out there. Uh, we're going to present you with an opportunity at this particular point. I was uh, in Oklahoma City back in October 2021 at a Philanthropy Southwest uh, Annual Conference as a part uh, with the Federal Reserve, I serve on an advanced together steering committee, and we're in a position to go out there to really uh, talk with foundations and see the work that they're doing. And if there's one thing that I picked up on at that conference is that foundations really uh, love the fa fact and relish the fact uh, that they can leverage the funding that they have, that they're utilizing. And so on the call today, you're going to have a number of individuals that uh, are going to talk about some of their efforts. Uh, I mean, the team has been doing some phenomenal work in that, that regard. And I remember when we created this program, we had a high demand job training program, and then we wanted to do uh, something in other areas. And so the TIP program, the Texas Industry Partnership Program was created, and it allows individuals uh, like yourself, many of you that are on this call today, an opportunity to really do some great things uh, to leverage the dollars that you're already utilizing. Employers continue to need a labor force that's out there. We talked about all the good things that are happening here in our great state of Texas, and we're proud of that. Caterpillar uh, moving to urban Texas is the latest, moving their headquarters here, and that's a phenomenal win uh, for the state of Texas, but we're not through. We don't rest on our laurels. The communities that are out there, 28 local workforce solution uh, boards that are out there, uh, those offices, I encourage you to get in touch with them uh, wherever, respective of your area. Uh, uh, Christy Cavan is a part of this, this team, and Mary and her team will make sure that you have access to all of those 28 local workforce boards. They even have boots on the ground out of their office that can help in your efforts as well. So you're never alone. There's always someone out there that can help you get answers to any questions that you might have as it relates to anything that we're doing here at the workforce. Mary mentioned, I'm proud to, re proud to represent the employers here in our state and excited about the opportunity to, to do so. And so if there's anything that my office can do to help in your efforts, we wanna be able to do uh, just that. And so uh, again, I wanna thank the panelists uh, for coming on today. Uh, you're, you've been there for us all the time. You're, you're, you're there for us and we don't take that for granted at all. Uh, all the foundations and, and, and those that are working with us, those that are, that are interested in working with us, I encourage you to take advantage of those opportunities that are out there. We're cutting the bureaucratic processes there. If there's anything that we can do better, uh, we look forward to receiving your input as it relates to what we're doing. And as I always say, we're gonna do this the Texas way. Uh, I started out by saying our economy is booming and, and that's the fact and, and, and we wanna do even more. And so we're bringing this information to you in hopes that you'll take full advantage of it and utilize it uh, the best way because it's a win-win situation and that uh, creates the best 
recipe for success uh, for us here in the great state of Texas. And so thank you day in and day out for what you're doing. Uh, Mary, again, congratulations to you and your team for even getting to this point uh, with this group. This is the beginning, the beginning steps, and we want to take this even further uh, as we go forward. And so I'm going to uh, zip my mouth here and turn it over to the man who probably needs no introduction, uh, but Robert Andrade manages the uh, uh, the TIP program uh, and other programs for, for the division. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and turn it over to you, Robert, and you, you take it away. And you guys have a great uh, conference, a great summit, and uh, we look forward to, uh, to circling back soon. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to thank uh, both uh, our director, Mary uh, York, and Commissioner Demerson for the introduction and, and the great words they provided uh, for us uh, as we get started. We've got a lot to cover. I want to make sure that we cover everything. Um, I do want to acknowledge before we start uh, that we have um, our, our contract side uh, is run by uh, James Golson and his team, uh, along with Sandra Williams. Uh, I wanted to make sure I acknowledge them. They are on the call and they are actually watching. So hopefully uh, we'll pick up a few things. Uh, please, uh, we'll, have, uh, we'll allow you to make some comments in the chat, uh, also your questions, but we'll get to that in just a bit. So let's get started. The Texas Industry Partnership Program, oh, wait, uh, let's, let's go back one slide. Just one slide. There you go. TIP was modeled after a program called the High Demand Job Training Program. This requires an economic development corporation participation. Uh, TIP was established to assist communities that do not have an economic development corporation. What this program does, it, it leverages private investment from corporations and foundations along with the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act funding or WIOA to build and enhance local board and employer partnerships. The local workforce board is an applicant for the project and they can apply for up to $150,000 per year. Corporations foundations match amount dollar per dollar with their cash contributions. In addition, the industry partner, the industry partner may choose to fund beyond 150,000. Projects are focused on occupations in six identified industry clusters. Um, the budget for the fiscal year 2022 is a million dollars and it's based on a first come first serve. So if, the, uh, if a board applies, um, if the money is there, a board applies, but if a board um, applies towards the end and there's no money, then uh, there's no money. Um, funds are available through August 31st, 2022. So let me speak just uh, for a second on the six industry clusters. These industry clusters, what we mean by cluster is these are the jobs that are associated with these clusters. So at, in advanced manufacturing, aerospace, aviation, and defense, biotechnology and life sciences, energy, information technology, and petroleum refining and chemical products. So these are jobs that are associated or occupations that are associated with each of these industry clusters, which means that there are quite a number. Each, each cluster may have uh, 500 to 1,000 jobs associated. So it really depends on what um, you're focused on, especially if you're pursuing a, a particular, uh, you're assisting a particular industry and you wanna make certain that they're in this particular cluster. Let's go on. So what, what can you use this money for? So allowable uh, activities include support direct training or related uh, training related costs. Uh, training, we can pay for training, uh, instructor salaries, tuition, equipment, consumable supplies, mentoring, skills assessment, supportive services, student transportation, a cluster analysis, minor renovations, and on that cluster analysis, uh, one of the uh, participating boards that are uh, participating today, they were actually the first one to actually ask us if they could do a cluster analysis. So um, lots of the communities uh, have done so. Um, but this does not include recruitment and outreach activities. So past projects, and we've had a number of projects, but I'm only highlighting a few of them. We've done a lot of IT education um, or IT training. 
But we've also done a number of uh, different types of training. And, and I'll give you an example. We've had grants uh, or applicants that have applied for uh, projects that included uh, IT education gap analysis. So what they were looking at is they were looking at information technology uh, training from K through postgraduate degrees. So what they wanted to know is where, uh, where are our gaps in our community? What training are we missing? That was a good analysis. Construction trades, advanced technology manufacturing. So we had a, a, an applicant that actually had multiple uh, industry clusters, which meant to us that they were focused on a variety of jobs and they wanted to make sure that they were covering as much as they could with the funding that they were receiving. Uh, construction trades, they had multiple construction trade grants that we've received uh, applications for. Life sciences, uh, we had a veterinarian assistance. They were looking to develop a program in the life sciences area concerning uh, veterinarian science. We did a healthcare analysis of a five county region in South Texas. We've done a, a multitude of different varieties of IT training. And there's a, a, a number of IT uh, related uh, projects that we've had, including IT security, um, IT security software applications. We have actually worked with manufacturing, uh, a number of applications uh, regarding manufacturing. And one in particular, a CNC machinist where they were looking to develop a program that would uh, fine tune a program, uh, a sector of their uh, of their training. So uh, they were focusing specifically on machining. In this IT cybersecurity project we had, this IT cybersecurity was the development of an actually a, a registered apprenticeship program uh, that started in the high school, progressed into the college, and then eventually wrapped up with a private trainer. This was to develop a cybersecurity specialist for the region. And a number of those, uh, a number of the trainees uh, got hired on right after they graduated. And we've also done an IT pre-apprenticeship program where we've actually worked with the high school developing IT programs to help these kids move into the field. Next one. So what did we use the money for? So a lot of times we'll get a question, they'll ask me, well, what can we use our money for? So this is just a quick uh, look at what we've done. Skills gap assessment. We we did a uh, we we paid or the WIOA and the private and the private in, uh, industry partner paid for a skills gap assessment for life sciences and advanced manufacturing industries. They wanted to take a look at what their region looked like, so they wanted to take a look at what areas are we not concentrating on as far as training. We did a training in industry certifications for transitioning service members and, veter and veterans into high demand IT fields. Now we've, we've done actually done this twice. Um, and this is a, a, a focus on exiting uh, service members, uh, exiting the, uh, the United States military. We've established a cybersecurity training academy and apprenticeship program, which I spoke of. Uh, we funded approximately 30% of cost of equipping a facility for advanced manufacturing. And this is for training. This was a training facility uh, up in the Northeast part, uh, up in the North part of Texas. We did a life sciences camp where uh, we, uh, there was an education for kids to learn more about the life sciences. We did a healthcare cluster analysis. We purchased healthcare sciences training equipment. Um, we've done skills gap analysis in the education supply chain. We did tuition reimbursement for trainees in the construction trades and welding equipment. Now, one would ask that construction trades, uh, how does that fit into the clusters? You'd be surprised at the number of different industry clusters that have a construction trade component to it. Um, for example, manufacturing has a large number of construction trades uh, added to it, electricians, plumbers, that sort of thing. Let's move on. So who can provide training? Well, the way we built this program, we built it so that the board can choose almost any trainer, a university, a college, independent school district, a private training company, a nonprofit trainer. We, what we focus on is 
uh, the board focuses on the output. They want to make certain that the individuals that are, that are being trained are trained for a, a, a high demand occupation in the region that fit into those six clusters. And so they look at whoever can actually offer the training best. Let's move on. So who can be a partner? Well, a business foundation or an industry foundation, uh, a business or corporation not self-serving, um, a business consortium, a business association, essentially it's the same as a business consortium, um, a nonprofit industry focused or other similar philanthropic organizations. Um, past industry partners, who's actually participated? And this is a small list of people that, a small list of companies that have actually participated, but Interdeject, Interg Texas has participated a number of times. The Borderplex Alliance and Medical Center of the Americas out of El Paso International Paper, Wells Fargo Foundation, um, Amistad, El Amistad Foundation, a manufacturing consortium of Texoma, Cyber Defense is incorporated. Uh, these are foundations, a healthcare consortium of Austin, which included St. David's Foundation, the Seton Foundation, and the Michael and Del, uh, Michael and Su uh, Susan and Michael Dell Foundation, CH Foundation out of Lubbock, the Borderplex Alliance, CCEI, the Hernandez Foundation, Mid Coast Construction Academy, um, EDU Vet, Veterinarian and Roscoe Collegiate ISD Foundation, the Rio Grande Valley Partnership. Prudential Financial Services, the Austin Technology Council, Panel Specialist Incorporated, Lamar Bruni Bergat Trust, and Laredo Community College Foundation, Microsoft Tectonic. Now, these are just a number of the businesses that have participated. And these companies participated with the thought that there is uh, there's something to gain for their industry. Let's move on. So there is a website. Um, in our website, the information, you can find additional information. There's a FAQ, um, inf uh, frequently asked questions uh, that you can find at our website at the uh, address listed below. So I'm gonna go into a couple of projects and I'll take a little bit of time here, but not too much. Um, there are two projects I'm gonna highlight. And just to give you an example of how this funding works. So, the Borderplex um, Workforce Solutions Borderplex out of El Paso submitted an application for $100,000. Now, they left $50,000 on the table. They could have actually applied for a second submission for $50,000. Their, their uh, cumulative grant amount per year is $150,000, but they only applied for $100,000. Their financial partners was the Council on Regional Economic Expansion and Educational Development, or CREED, and the El Paso Community Foundation. To, uh, Together, they contributed $100,000. Their training partner was the University of Texas El Paso, and the number of trainees that they were training were 20. So they had a couple of issues. The issues they had were they had multiple MOUs, a memorandum of understandings or an agreement between the parties, and they were working with the university. And so this grant allowed for uh, some training for people in the um, in high demand sector jobs that uh, these were instructors that were going to train in that field at the ISD level. So this is to generate interest into those fields that we have a demand for uh, and those jobs that fit into those six demand industry clusters that we spoke of earlier. So working with the university, they were looking to uh, add a some uh, work related training and they were uh, looking to uh, offer some payment to help those uh, those particular uh, students uh, get through their training so this is work related training funding uh, we had the multiple mous they had is they had to have not just one mou but they had to have two with two different partners and the university now today, their virtual presence is Alma Aranda with the Workforce Development Director uh, with Workforce uh, Solutions Borderplex and Stephanie Otero with Vice President of Operations 
of the El Paso Community Foundation. It'll speak perhaps later regarding those two projects, that particular project. Now, this last one, this last project is with the Gulf Coast. Workforce Solutions Gulf Coast, they had one application. They submitted for 50,000. And as I mentioned earlier, there was still $100,000 they could have applied for with another grant if they chose. But this one year, they were focused on one particular initiative. They were working with the Texas Mutual Insurance Company, but they were also working with Trio Education Foundation. Now, Trio, uh, Trio Electric is the company that actually is the, the parent company and Trio Education Foundation is the foundation component of that company. And they were looking to develop further into the Houston region, some electri electricians training. So they applied for a grant with Texas Mutual Company and they leveraged that grant, their $50,000 for an additional 50,000 to expand that training there in Houston. They were working with multiple school districts and the number of trainees were 107 students. So they also had multiple MOUs. So they had to, uh, that took a little more time they had to develop the grant. Um, so as they go through the process, they have, to, uh, they have to have a grant or an agreement with their partners, not just the grant, uh, the grant uh, awarder, uh, Texas Mutual, but also with the school districts and also with the TRIO. This particular grant was a good grant. We've, we've actually done, we've actually uh, duplicated the same type of grant in other parts of the state. And I'll, when we get to that point, we'll, we'll let Jeremiah speak on it. But Jeremiah Bentley with the Vice President of Marketing and Community Affairs, the Texas Mutual Company is with us today. And so is, so is Susan Dixon. She's the Employer Service Manager of Workforce Solutions Gulf Coast. So, at this point, I'm going to let you know that we are going to take questions from you. We want you to submit your questions in the chat box. And at the end of our, our uh, questions and answers with our, with our industry partners and our boards, we are going to ask you, we're going to answer your questions. So feel free to ask a question. If you're uncertain or unclear about a particular issue, please feel free to submit that question. So let's, uh, let's move on. So I'm going to introduce the panelists, and um, we have a, a good a good number of panelists, and they're all uh, people that I've, I've worked with, or at least worked with the organization a few times now. Um, first up is Alma Aranda. She's with the Borderplex Workforce Board, uh, Workforce Solutions Borderplex. Alma Aranda is the Workforce Development Director at Workforce Solutions Borderplex. After a seven-year tenure immersing herself in the world of community development, over a decade of combined experience in project management and program development, she's refined her passion in leadership and workforce development. Alma recognized effectiveness stems from the key strength in data, and data analytics and research to help create innovative progressive programs. She firmly believes that, there, that they are there, tailored opportunities and career pathways for everyone with the right support system. She's passionate about creating programs that uplift individuals, businesses, and communities by leveraging partnerships. Susan Dixon, Gulf Coast Workforce Board, Workforce Solutions Gulf Coast. Susan Dixon is the Employer Service Manager for the Gulf Coast Workforce Board, Workforce Solutions, and has been with the organizations for the past seven years and with the workforce system for 21 years. Susan's focus has been and continues to be helping employers solve work, work, workforce related business problems and building talent pipelines for the next generation of workforce. By working together with industry leaders of all sizes to create solutions, Susan can form a partnership that can assist a company in being more competitive in the ever changing worldwide economy. Susan currently sits on several advisory councils, chambers, economic development, and community-based organizations through the 13 county region. Jeremiah Bentley, Texas Mutual Insurance Company. Jeremiah Bentley is the Vice President of Marketing and Community Affairs of the Texas Mutual Insurance Company, the Texas, the state's leading provider of work, workers' compensation insurance. He oversees the company's marketing and public relations 
advertising, community relations, digital media, and customer outreach efforts. He previously worked in the community communication and government affairs over his 20 year career with the company. Jeremiah is on the board of directors for the Greater Austin Chamber of Commerce, Leadership Austin, United Way for Greater Austin, the Austin Education Fund, and the Greater Austin Hispanic Chamber. Susan Ortero, El Paso Community Foundation. Susan Ortero is the Vice President of Operations for the El Paso Community Foundation and also serves as the manager for the EPCM construction responsible for building La Nube, El Paso's new children museum and science center. El Paso has been her home since 1998 and she joined the staff at the EPCF, which is El Paso Community Foundation in 2011, where she primarily works on the foundation's education and arts projects. She currently serves on boards of the, of the Down Center Coalition of El Paso, Early Matters El Paso, Vision El Paso, El Paso Special Needs Education, Center and the PSI. Welcome, everyone. If I can have their uh, their, their 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 pictures up, please. So we're going to go right into our questions. Um, and there's a number of questions that we're going to cover, and I want to make sure that each one of you are aware of um, of the questions. And so we're going to poke, we're going to put up the questions each each time that we ask a question. So let's get started. So on this first question, this question's for our board, uh, our board representatives. This first question is, can you tell me about your workforce tip projects? Uh, Ms. Aranda. Uh, um, sure. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Aranda. So we love the tip uh, grant funding. Um, what we have found is that it, it, it has actually provided us a platform to be very innovative. It's some of the more transformational projects that we have been able to, uh, to develop is because of TIP, and that's because it, it, it's statewide funding, and so they're not, you're, you're not looking at the barriers and restrictions that sometimes our traditional formula funds have, such as Leo or some of our other programs. So we really get to kind of um, play with that a little bit. And so as Robert mentioned, uh, I just kind of wanted to share a little bit about some of the things that we have done. So. One of our first projects was the skills gap project, and it was really important in our region. We knew that we, um, we just as the rest of Texas, we have a huge need in you know and and opportunities to fill uh, the workforce gaps in the healthcare system. But we're also trying to really um, expand our manufacturing and go into advanced manufacturing, um, and just kind of really look at that. So we really needed to kind of do an assessment of where we were in our region and what our deficiencies and strengths were. And so that skills gap analysis really was really critical. And from there, it just kind of really stemmed. Um, a couple of the projects that I wanted to highlight was uh, Robert talked a little bit about the partnership um, with UTEP, a Pasta Community Foundation and Creed. And this for us is also a very transformational project. It's probably one of our most successful projects because the state of Texas actually picked up the model and is now offering it to uh, various IEPs across the state. But Stephanie can go into a little bit about that. But what we found was, you know, with, with everything, you know, for me, and of course, very biased, all world, uh, all roads lead to workforce, right? So we knew that, but it really starts with education and just kind of even looking back at the, at the 60 by 30 Texas and what that pipeline meant. We knew that we had to have, you know, teachers in the K-12 system that could um, be prepared and, and inspire students to really kind of go into these fields, these STEM, you know, related fields. So we, you know, we, we did go into the gray area a little bit about the industry cultures, um, but through our application, we had very compelling data of why this was really important. And so what we also realized, so um, it was a, a lot of layers and a lot of partners that I'm more than willing to share, you know, some of what we did, you know, with, if anybody has questions. Like you can contact me. But um, what we found was at the end of the day, when we're looking at students and training and the need and the extraship is, is a game changer, you know, because it provides us the actual work experience. But if it's been paid, it creates a financial barrier. And this is where we leverage our tip funding, where some of our more um, transformative um, 
outcomes have, have uh, provided um, have been provided because of TIP. So we we looked at this model that we had with with uh, the UTIP Yoast Prep model, and it took teachers into a year long externship, which is really prepares them because we have a high turnover. Teachers, there's a shortage. You know, if if, if it's education is directly linked, you know, to workforce outcomes, we all know that. But we were what we're seeing is that by providing them the financial support to do these externships. We were relieving that that barrier, and then we had um, an, an increase in persistence rate. So the first time that we did this project with this model, we had 20 students. 19 students completed successfully, graduated, got their certification, and went on and stayed within the region as well. Um, and and so we, we were able to kind of repeat that with different school districts and show them like you know. So one of the things that we always try to do is make this sustainable. So we've been able to take that model and then we applied it to the healthcare industry. And so we actually partnered with Texas Tech and through their foundation and, and, and Trellis, we did the same thing with nurses. We um, definitely with nurses, but the clinical externship is, is you know, part of part of their, their program. But what we saw was that a lot of students um, were trying to moonlight, although they're not supposed to really work. Well, they're, they're doing, you know, what well, they're, they're in this program. Um, you know, students have to put food on the table. And so, you know, by providing the, the, the work experience, the paid work experience for the clinicals, we were actually able to do that. And we had, you know, again, I think we had a 100% success rate. So we've been able to take that model um, and just and, and kind of really apply it to different industries. Right now, we've got an application that we just submitted um, this past week to uh, another partner, but working with, um, students as well, um, providing the work experience and financial tax um, through, you know, um, services and stuff like that. So those are some of the, the, the things that we did, you know, but we, we did the cybersecurity one with Wells Fargo, um, Microsoft, um, and, and Tectonic. That was an apprenticeship program. Um, and so, and then right now, you know, we're looking at what we can do with, um, uh, you know, manufacturing and aerospace and that. So, you know, for me, the experience has been really great. Uh, we, we get a lot of support, but this is what I consider transformational funds. Um, and of course, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Alma. And you know, uh, you are our largest user of the, the Borderplex, uh, Workforce Solutions Borderplex is the largest user of our programs. You've got a lot to cover and there's a lot of information. I appreciate your, your input. Thank you. Susan, I'm gonna ask you the same question. Can you tell me about your workforce tip projects? Sure. Um, so you had um, mentioned that it started in 2017, and I think um, you know COVID hit 2019. We had a few lined up. Um, unfortunately, those um, didn't get to come to fruition only because of COVID hit. Um, businesses had challenges. People had challenges, right? Um, and just working through the pandemic. So we're kind of on the mend now and uh, ramping back up. And of course the Trio Electric um, Education um, was our first um, real um, initiative into the, uh, into the TIP um, pipeline. And it worked out really well. Um, it also braided in our other services that we were um, already doing, which is the pre-apprenticeship opportunity, the registered apprenticeship opportunity where we were able to train um, specifically those students in, a, in two of the school districts um, as they entered into the pre-apprenticeship program and then went into a full-blown registered apprenticeship um, program by the time they were done and graduating from their high school um, being seniors and, and offering them financial stability. It's a win-win. It's probably one of the easiest projects, knock on wood, I should say at this point in time, um, to, to really be able to do and get a really big impact um, it not only impacts the, the trainees, but it impacts um, the business and it's a, a very valuable impact for the board and the community. It's a huge economic win um, for everyone because you're, um, you're upskilling, you're reskilling, you're adding new people to um, the next generation of workforce pipeline. And it's extremely important to, to build these types of initiatives out and be successful. Um, because they're just, they're valuable. And we have to learn what the secret sauce is to, to building that talent. And this is, this is one of them. So it was extremely successful to us. Um, and they're looking at doing um, another 
um, partnership, uh, actually Trail Education is with us here um, shortly, but it's been very successful. I know you've got uh, a couple. I know that uh, there's another electric company that's in your area that has shown yes. interest and one of your colleges has also shown interest using a, a, an energy company as their partner. Um, I know that we've had discussion, but I know they're coming. So let me, let's move on to question number two. What was your experience working with the TIP program for your workforce project? And Susan, I'm gonna start with you. What was your experience um, working with, the, the, with our program? Sure, I loved it. Um, I have to, and I probably will sound like a broken record over and over and over again, but this is one of the easiest applications from the Texas Workforce Commission for us, um, for our experience. Um, being a newbie um, to it um, and the largest board, we've done so many other things, skills development, current worker training. Um, the Texas Industry Partnership is um, great. It's just a wonderful opportunity. It's a, it's a simple one page. Um, most of it already comes to the board through our partner, right? Um, who's, who's wanting to do the training. Um, they've got all the details. We're adding uh, the little tidbits that need to be done, making sure all of the um, budget looks good uh, and you know ready to submit the application. Uh, the MOUs um, are a little bit trickier. The memorandum of understandings were the, the most trickiest piece of it, just making sure that we had our I's dotted, T's crossed and everything was um, gone through approval for signatures. We were on board, um, but it was very, very easy. We also put into place with best practices. We met with TRIO Education Weekly um, we met with them, one, to make sure that we stayed in budget. Um, as you may or may not know, we have supply chain issues, right? And so what does that mean for construction, manufacturing, or industry in general? Um, you have to bring that into the equation and possibly reevaluate and move things around um, that make the most sense and still be able to have a successful project. So those weekly meetings, um, just to hear about the challenges um, kept us up to date and kept us alert as to what's going on um, in industry and just to find better solutions um, to be able to make sure that that was um, a, a very successful project. But by hands down, I would do this over and over and over again to those that are out there. This is very, very simple. Thank you. And now the next question, same question, uh, but to Ms. Aranda with the Borderflex. Sure. Um, also, uh, definitely piggyback off of what Susan mentioned. It is a very easy application, and um, and then you get a lot of support. I mean, I, I definitely want to share that with all the workforce boards uh, that are on this call. Is you know the uh, the OEI division and working with Robert is, has been really phenomenal because it's one of those applications and a grant application that we submit. But we'll get immediate feedback. So if there's like a question or something that we need to clarify, it just really gives us an opportunity to successfully put the application forward and get it approved. And the turnaround time has been great. And um, and just to share what Robert mentioned, we are on our eighth tip application. We are one of those regions that doesn't have an actual formal EDC. So for us, you know, the, the funding is vital. Um, and again, just really simple. It, it allows a lot of people. We do have to put them in twist, but even the application itself allows for a percentage of admin. So it, it's definitely it's 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 an easy win for in, in in our so we will do this you know every year, and then there's opportunities to submit two. We will submit two applications as well. So um, thank you. Let's move to question number three. So how many times have you applied for TIP funds and will you be applying? Again, uh, Alma, you've answered that question, but uh, please uh, number and, and will you be applying? Yeah, like I said, we, we just submitted our eighth application and we're already prepping our ninth application. That's how good it is. <laughs> what about you, Susan? What about you, Susan? Yes, so um, we have, um, again, we, we went ahead and uh, we've submitted one and completed one so far. And I believe we've got a couple, two or three in the pipeline. We're just um, waiting for our partner to make sure that we have the, the donor match and that we have all the details. Um, but we will definitely continue to apply um, throughout the year um, when we can um, to make sure that we meet those uh, deadlines for putting in our application. But we've got a couple more in the pipeline that we'll be submitting really, really soon. 
Thank you. Well, let's get to question number four. So um, question number four, this is actually for our industry partner and our board. Um, how did you first learn about the tip and what made you want to partner on a project? Uh, let's, let's start with Stephanie Ortero. Sure, good morning, everybody. Um, honestly, we at the foundation did not know about the tip grant prior to our first project, but we enjoy an incredible relationship with our local board. We you know, cannot say enough great things about Alma and, and Layla. Um, you know, partnership collaboration is what makes work move forward within a region. And so we have this dream of how do we create impactful, meaningful uh, work experience for those going into the education field, which we argue have an impact on all six industry clusters, right? We need support for students coming into those clusters so they can be successful. And so really we knocked on workforce's um, door and said, Alma, what can we do? How can we make this work? We cannot have these candidates work in graveyard shifts and have meaningful work experience. We need a way for it to be paid meaningful work experience. And we really just had a brainstorming session and almost like, I wonder if tip could work. And so, um, you know, like she said, the support at the state level um, from you specifically, Robert, in helping us think through this and, and really what turned out was uh, two programs, two years in a row that led to the state looking at this and now there's state funding coming down through a, a different uh, funding source to support, you know, paid work experience for teacher candidates. Um, so really it was a it started with a conversation and the idea that collaboration is how we get work done. Excellent. Jeremiah, same question. And by the way, before you start, um, Lori Bricker uh, is a good friend and uh, Andrea, I believe is on the call as well from TRIO. I just wanted to make sure you knew that they were listening. So go ahead, Jeremiah. Well, then I'll put it, I'll say they're awesome. And we love, we love working with them for, for many reasons. Um, the first time that we sort of learned about TIP along with all the other, um, you know, funding opportunities available through the Office of uh, Employer Partnerships was uh, at a Workforce Solutions Capital Area, who we have a good relationship with since that's what our corporate office is, had a, an a, event on the community workforce plan and it really connected with us and we really saw the opportunity that really aligned with sort of our goals. And it was Commissioner Demerson that was one of the presenters and uh, talked about all the things from the office. And then later on, we had a chance to meet with um, meet with the team and sort of understand each of the funding opportunities better. And so then when these have come up, we've been able to, to leverage those because we know a little bit about each. Um, but then I think I would echo what Stephanie said, like the, the boards are really the experts on this. And a lot of the information we get is really, you know, in the application from them when we do our grant funding. But it's been a really successful program for us. That's great. Well, let's get to question number five. And this is uh, actually, th these questions are for uh, Jeremiah and Stephanie. So can you share the importance of community workforce development projects to your organization? Uh, Jeremiah, let's start with you. Sure. Uh, so Texas Mutual Insurance Company, we're a work comp insurer. We just do work comp and we just do it in Texas. So our success is directly tied to the strength of the economy and the success of Texas business. Um, and the number one things that we, even before the pandemic that we heard from employers is like this um, recruiting qualified talent is the biggest challenge that they face. And we also know that a skilled worker is a more productive worker and a safer worker. So for us, it really, it's really the core of what we do in terms of funding projects that both allow us to meet our mission um, and then also help like support our goal of creating a stronger, safer Texas for all. So these are really, really, really important projects to us is a company that that funds a lot of a lot of work and then also needs to be able to meet the needs of, of all Texans, whether they're insured by us or not. So that's where we've seen really these community projects coming together um, are really good for us. And you know, every time we want to be able to, to amplify our funds when we are um, when we are giving out checks or giving out grants. So that's that's what we always look for are partnerships because none of us are gonna be able to fix any of these issues that we deal with. Um, alone, but we've got to work together. I agree. Uh, Stephanie, I'm going to uh, ask you the same question. Yeah, so, you know, at the core of a healthy community is a healthy workforce. And as Jeremiah said, you know, we each in the sort of philanthropy world, we have X number of dollars. And any time that we can figure out a way 
to, you know, in this case, double the impact we can have with matching dollars. I mean, that's a win-win for everybody. Mm -hmm. I also think that the thought partnership that goes in collaborating is critical to the su success of programs. We each bring to the table a different perspective, different expertise. And so working together with our workforce board, our local workforce board that brings in a whole nother um, element of expertise just amplifies the work and ensures success. And I would say the third piece is, is that, you know, Alma talked about the ability of the TIP grant to allow for innovation. Sometimes you need a starting place for that innovation for proof of concept to show the success that it can have. And that it gives you that time to build the sustainable piece, which is really important to philanthropy, right? We want to make sure that our dollars can keep going to new initiatives by building sustainability into the work that we're currently doing. And that is something we were able to build with Alma and her team was using the TIP grant to create innovation, do an amazing um, work experience. And then while we were doing that, that experience, that pilot, building out the sustainable model and how do we capacity build it across our community? You know, you make a good point, Stephanie. And I wanted to say this, uh, the idea that uh, this is more of a uh, the grant could be used more as a seed into a, a sustainable program is a great way to use these funds. You're building a program that would that could potentially be sustainable program for the entire community. And I, I often push that thought on to the partners to look at how they're developing their project and look at sustainability. Uh, is this a short-term fix or, is, or are you looking at a long-term fix? So good point, thank you. Let's move on to question number six. So can you tell me by your organization how someone applies for funds? And now this, this particular question is for Stephanie first. Sure. So we're a community foundation, which means we grant into all sectors. Um, we have two main grant cycles, one that is in January, one that is in June, and then we have some specialty grant cycles throughout the year. Um, it would take probably an hour for me to share every grant opportunity um, that we offer. What I would recommend to those that live within our granting um, boundaries, which would be uh, El Paso County, Southwest New Mexico and Wattis because we grant into and partnerships that Texas does with the border um, is to go to our website epcf.org and look at the grant cycles that we have available. Um, we try to make the grant applications um, not too complicated and simple so that the community can ask it. And more importantly, what I would say is we welcome people to reach out to us for conversations, as I mentioned, we had with Alma, because a lot of things come out of those conversations. So we encourage those that have innovative ideas or ways that we can um, support the workforce within the El Paso community to reach out to us and talk about what potential collaborations um, we can come up with. Great. Um, Jeremiah, the same question. Uh, but before you answer, I do want to make note that there are a number of initiatives that I've seen uh, Texas Mutual on, uh, especially on TV, we've seen a number of commercials that have Texas Mutual attached. So I know you, you all are doing quite a bit in the central Texas, but please tell me how does your organization, uh, and tell me about your organization, how someone applies for funds. Sure thing. So we also uh, have two, two grant cycles a year uh, in the spring, which is the one we just closed. We focus on early childhood education, health and wellness, and, um, wraparound social services for working Texas families. Um, the one that's probably more relevant here is we do one in the fall every year. So that will open probably in September this year around workforce development, safety training. Um, because we're statewide, uh, anybody in the state of Texas is encouraged to apply. And I, I would, we get a lot of applications from Dallas and Houston and Austin because I think people are really good about finding out about those there, but you know, we're here for everybody. And so always, if, if, if you're a board that's somewhere not, you know, out, out and around, we would love to hear from you because we don't get as many applications um, during that from from all across the state as we would like to do it. So that's that's generally our process. Um, so you can go to texasmutual.com slash community funding, which will have all the specifics around the types of projects we're looking to fund and the timelines and all the things like that. But that's how it works for us. So uh, to both of you, before I move on to the next question, you all offer uh, training for people with disabilities. Um, 
uh, as funding, uh, grant funding uh, awards for people with disabilities? We, that was one of our focus areas last year, and I expect it will be again in the workforce development funding is uh, veterans, folks with disabilities, and then um, uh, criminal, criminally justice involved individuals were ones that we put specific uh, areas of focus on beyond just sort of general projects. What about you, Stephanie? Absolutely. We have several funds that fund granting within um, uh, folks with disabilities. That grant cycle is our January grant cycle. It opens January 1st, closes February 1st. Um, we bucket um, different categories between our January and our June grant cycle. So if you're interested in that, uh, look particularly at the January grant cycle. Great. Thank you. Next question, number seven. Uh, we are about four questions away from finishing our questions and answers uh, with our panelists. So uh, if you haven't uh, added your question to our chat box or question and answer box, please do so. If your uh, audience members, please do so. Number seven, a foundation has many ways it can invest its funding. What do you look for in a project? And let's start with Jeremiah. Yeah, uh, like Stephanie, we try to make the... Uh application process as easy as possible. And we try to only ask questions that are actually dire directly relevant to the things that we're gonna fund. So for us, there's um, sort of four important buckets of information. One is collaboration, right? And that's where it comes to, you know, will this grant, uh, is there opportunities to draw down additional funding, you know, in this grant, that's an important part of it that gets back to the whole, how we need to come together as a community to solve things. We wanna know what data folks are using. We want to know what outcomes and like whether these are going to be outcomes that affect systems in a region. Um, and then we all we care a lot about um, diversity, and that's in making sure that the folks who are being served by this grant ultimately have some say in the work. Whether it's as part of a focus group, you know, we love it when there's an executive director or board members who sort of are in this affected population. And but those generally are big areas of uh, that we look for when we're scoring grant applications and evaluating which ones we're going to fund. What about yourself, Stephanie? Sure. Um, we similarly have some categories to, to what Jeremiah was talking about. Um, certainly, you know, at the forefront is impact. We want to know what the impact is going to be on our region. Um, to innovation, um, we are very much willing to take risks and, and, you know, go outside the box because we believe innovation begets change. Um, like Jeremiah, diversity, we talk a lot about inclusion and, and making sure that there are no social, cultural, physical, or financial barriers um, for people within our community to access a better quality of life. And then the last piece, which I highlighted before, and, and you, Robert, brought it um, out as well, sustainability and the ability to build capacity within the, the project across the region. We love small pilots that build proof of concept, that, that you know, push on innovation, but we always want to make sure that the conversation starts with how do we make this sustainable and how do we make it accessible to everyone in our community. Wonderful. I, I will tell you that uh, being familiar with both of your organizations, um, Collaboration is really the key uh, to making this work. So let's move on to question number eight. Your organization partnered with the local workforce board in applying for TIP funding. Tell me briefly about your experience. Now you've all both have touched on it, but is there anything else that you want to make a comment on? Uh, let's start with Stephanie this time. I would just say go for it. Um, I cannot tell you the amazing support that both our local uh, workforce board and of course we have good you know close relationships with Alma and Layla and then sort of indirectly with the state workforce board um, I really believe that you all want us to succeed right and you want to help us succeed and you want to help move this work forward and a lot of times people hear the word grant and it's a scary word they're fearful of I don't know how to write a grant the grant is hard to to write what what are the parameters who's going to make sure i'm doing everything right and i would say let all of that go and go for it because workforce has set this up so that it can support partnerships collaboration philanthropy industry coming with our workforce boards and like alma said it's not like you submitted and if there's one wrong thing it's like nope x you're out 
forever. Right. It's let's talk about this. How can we adjust this? What do we need to um, change? What, you know, how can we make this successful? And that is incredible and doesn't happen with all grants. And so I, I just say, you know, go for it. What about yourself, Jeremy? Yeah, I don't have a ton to add to that. I had we've had the same experience. That for us, we did about eighty-five strategic grants last year. So we need a lot of. We don't know all these systems. We need a lot of help. And I think our our board did a great job of sort of just telling us what we needed to do. You know, helping helping move us along so we were able to take the most advantage of these programs. So let's go in question number nine. And this is a question that uh, we've actually gone through already, but. I'm gonna let Alma uh, take us through this one. Take me through the development of your project. So um, for us, I, we really kind of do lean into the research and, and what does the data tell us, but what, what is the story behind the data, right? And not just the report and what are we trying to solve? I mean, we, we really, it sounds a little corny, but we really do take the solution part of our name very serious. And, and we do, we feel that we can contribute to a lot of solutions and things that are going on in our community. So that's kind of really where it starts. And then uh, as we try to look for that and that solution um, is what how we start to develop the application. So um, sometimes we go to partners you know, for an idea that we have, or, or as Stephanie mentioned, it's a conversation. But the one thing I want to kind of point out, and, and Stephanie mentioned this, there is nothing like matching funds from a partner, whether it's private or foundation, if they already want to invest in the community and you're going to double that money, that strengthens their partnership, like even after the grant. So, um, you know, not only, I know, because I'm a fan of private as well, but the partnerships and the relationships that you have after the, the TIP grant is, is really important. I mean, we've, we've made really great partners through, through all of these grants and, mm -hmm. and we're, looked, we're looked at as a source um, in our community now to go and try to look and solve these things. So it's just been really great. Wonderful. Uh, Susan, what about yourself? Take me through the development of your project. Sure. It's much like Alma had described. Um, it all starts with a consultation with employers, right? Um, we have 160,000 employers here in the Gulf Coast region and you know, reaching out, talking to them, consult, setting up one-on-one -on -one consultations to hear what their wants and needs are, and then designing a customized solution. Uh, we don't believe in cookie cutter solutions. Uh, we believe in designing the right fit for that employer, um, no matter what it is in training. And so what we do then is we then start looking at the initiatives, what would be the best fit. Um, and in a lot of cases, it is, it is the Texas Industry Partnership um, opportunity um, because it has a lot of flexibility with it. And it's, again, very easy. Um, and it's, um, it's pretty quick. Uh, by the time you do the, by the time the employer submits the assessment, you fill out the application as a board, you submit it, the time frame it goes very, very quickly. And so it gives you a lot of opportunity to um, develop what it's going to look like, the, the training piece of it, who's going to be the partners, and actually the, the overall successful uh, of the program. Um, but it starts with an employer. Um, we're very employer driven and without employers, it's very hard for us to do our work. So it starts with a good consultation with an employer. Thank you. Uh, Jeremiah? Yeah. Um, uh, like I said, one of the important things on us is, is the ability to access other funds. Um, and so for us, it's always one of the other things that we're looking at um, for, for any project that we do. And so we always appreciate like the workforce boards or other partners that we have um, sort of understanding the landscape and helping us walk us through what we're doing because we haven't we've done this for a few years we haven't done it for a ton and we're not like subject matter experts in every every different bucket of funding so you know we appreciate the support from the from, and from the state too like we have, have a great relationship with y'all um, to sort of help us develop a project in a way that's going to make the most difference what about yourself stephanie I would say it starts with a group of people coming together who understand that we are going to collectively take responsibility for an improvement we want to see within our community. 
Um, oftentimes we live in silos or within lanes that we think we're supposed to stay in. And I really think amazing, impactful work happens when we all decide that we're going to collectively take responsibility for solving a challenge or a barrier within our community. And in our case, it was how do we provide meaningful, impactful, paid work experience for um, those that are going to go into the teaching field. And so really the development was understanding who all the stakeholders needed to be at the table and recognizing that we were all willing to get outside of our traditional lanes and work together to solve this. And, and what really came out of this was a program that then TEA at the state level said, that is best practice, that is the model. And it actually led to direct funding for paid work experience in districts across our state. So not only did we create something that helped solve an issue within our community, but then through workforce and, and through TEA and spreading that information across the state, we in fact created a program that then is now getting duplicated and sustainable funding across the state of Texas. I mean, I couldn't be more proud of our workforce board willing and, and the state um, workforce board to think of the TIP grant to allow us to have such amazing both regional and statewide impact. I mean, it's been incredible. You know, uh, as a native El Paso, and nothing makes me happier when I hear that El Paso once again is that leader. Uh, they're always the outside of the box thinkers. They're, we created a whole uh, avenue of training and uh, ideas through that whole uh, border plex mentality, which is wonderful. Let's move on to question number 10. And with two more questions and we're, we're about done. And these questions are for the industry only. We'll start with Stephanie. Do you think the recipients of your organization's funds could expand their own efforts by having the local workforce board apply for matching funds through their TIP program? I mean, absolutely, right? Anytime that you can add dollars upon dollars upon dollars, it just you know has exponential um, impact across the, the community. And I think you mentioned before, collaboration is at the heart of everything that we do. And this TIP grant sort of provides a foundation to create those collaborations and a way to mix um, dollars that people hadn't thought of in the past, right? Philanthropy was over here, workforce was here, in, uh, corporations were here. And what really the TIP grant has done is create an avenue that we can put those dollars together and collectively um, magn magnify the impact across a community. Um, so absolutely, um, we could not have had the effect that we had um, in our community with our particular TIP grant that you're, you're choosing to highlight today um, without the, the workforce matching um, funds through the TIP grant. What about yourself, Jeremiah? Yeah, absolutely. And I'd echo what Stephanie said. I mean, we're all in this together, you know, and there's this sometimes, it's not intentional, but, you know, we don't think about sort of the connections between private industry and government and philanthropy and how we can all work together at this systems level to change issues um, in particular regions and all across the state. So, I think the more awareness that uh, organizations, recipients can have about the opportunities through the workforce board. I mean, I think the boards are wonderful resources that are often misunderstood and underutilized um, around the state by business. And we talk a lot about that, you know, and, and really try to amplify the message of the ability to support folks. And so I think it makes a ton of sense for recipient organizations to learn what's available to them and then utilize the resources to their most potential. Thank you. We're on our last question before we take questions from the audience. And uh, this question is for Jeremiah. Would you encourage the recipients of your funds to reach out to the local workforce board to expand upon those funds your organization has awarded to them? Yeah, uh, yes, absolutely. I think we've talked about that. And I think we maybe even have one in the works right now where we uh, made the grant, didn't realize that there was an opportunity to have some matching funds. And then uh, we're able to go back in after the fact, sort of take the unexpended, unexpended resources and take advantage of it. So just because you've written the check up, you know, up front doesn't necessarily mean that you're shut out, shut out of the opportunity. So I would definitely encourage folks to talk to their, talk to their local boards and really understand what's available and maybe how we can maximize um, the value of any grant that we make so that we can help uh, solve the problems of our communities. So would you encourage the recipients uh, that have been, that received funds from you all to reach out to us and get them to uh, the possibility of helping themselves. 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Whether you thought about it up front or not as a recipient, you know, please, please reach out and, and do that. Um, and we can do more, do more together. Good. What about yourself, Stephanie? I mean, absolutely. Yes. And, and what I would say is, you know, to have the greatest impact that you can, you have to sort of understand where all the funds can be used and how they can be used. And we talk a lot about in philanthropy, we want to make sure that we bring everybody to the table and we're having conversations because we don't want our dollars to duplicate what other dollars could do. We want our dollars to amplify or match or, you know, create a larger pot in which we can do impactful work. And the only way that's going to happen is to encourage our recipients to talk to workforce so that if workforce dollars can do X, Y, Z, and then we can do ABC and we put it together and we have this amazing impact, you know, that we're not duplicating efforts, but we're collaborating and amplifying efforts. And that only happens if you reach out. And the worst thing that can happen, I always tell people is the answer is no. And what nothing, no one's going to die. No one, nothing, no earth shattering earthquakes are going to happen. And it's almost never a no. It's well, that's a great idea. We need to tweak it. We need to think about this. Can we bring in this other partner? And so don't be afraid to reach out and then work through a solution. You know, as Alma said, they take that very much to heart, the idea of the solution um, and how do we create that solution that's going to have an impact across our community. Wonderful. I, I want to add this piece to what you said. Um, the, the information you provide to your uh, recipients uh, is important. Uh, I know that uh, you've uh, informed uh, through Lori Bricker over at TRIO working uh, with uh, Texas Mutual to the Greater Dallas area. I know that Greater Dallas has an application that they're looking to expand uh, funds that you've awarded that particular region. We've gotten grants, uh, not just the Butterplex for uh, El Paso Community Foundation and their uh, a lot of the region, but under Texas Mutual, we've also worked with um, the Central Texas uh, capital area, that is uh, Austin um, and also the Gulf Coast. Um, there is a number of these grants that have been, that other partners, other foundations that have actually participated have done the same. Uh, I can think of one right off the top of my head is CH Foundation in Lubbock. They've also uh, put up some funding up Front and uh, we match those funds to develop a training program, some equipment in the Lubbock area. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, it, I, you know, we're going to go on to the questions and answers from the audience, but I've got about a minute left. Uh, does any of the, any of the four of you have a last comment you want to make on uh, anything that we've addressed, Alma? Uh, just again, and um, I love the way Stephanie said it. it it's really no harm, no foul, right? We just, it, it's simple application. Um, it strengthens partnerships and, and you, you've got the division and, and somebody like Robert is gonna guide you through it. So I do encourage the workforce to take advantage of it. Susan, thank yeah, you. Uh, yeah, I'll piggyback off what Elma said. Um, definitely encourage those of you that are on the call um, to try it. Um, it's, it's a very rewarding opportunity. Um, but I do want to also say, Robert, thank you to you and your team at Texas Workforce Commission, because we couldn't do this without you. Um, you've been a great partner to us in helping us walk through it and answer all of our crazy questions that we have sometimes. So thank you to your, you and your team. But I encourage everyone on the call to think about doing this opportunity. Uh, Jeremiah? Yeah, I think I'll... Thank you, I'll, thank you Susan. Yeah, I think I'll echo what, what Susan said and, and just say, you know, we really... Um, appreciate the support and appreciate the knowledge. And, you know, we know, we know work comparably well, and we don't necessarily always know like the grant world and matching funds very well. So we, we definitely um, enjoy the resources that y'all provided in order to help us be successful and make the most change possible. And, and, and Stephanie, and thank you, Jeremiah. I would just say we're better together. And the way that this is set up, um, at the state and local level is about being better together and making impact. And, you know, I encourage people to think outside the box and think beyond where they thought before and bring those conversations um, to the forefront so that, you know, innovation and new ideas and a multiple sets of expertise can come together to, to, to better their community. Thank you all. Um... 
I, I this has been uh, rewarding, uh, informational, and uh, grateful. And uh, let's move on to the uh, questions from the audience. Um, so next, uh, the next slide is the uh, audience questions and answers from the chat. I'm gonna read a couple of questions and uh, I'm gonna allow uh, the boards, if it appropriate or the our industry partners to answer. So uh, the first few are for me actually, are administrative exp uh, expenses allowed to be included in the application? Uh, for the board, yes, um, you can allow for 5% of your administrative costs to be included, not in addition to the 150, but incorporated into the 150,000 that you're receiving from us. This is important to know. Um, who can go through the training? Full-time, part-time, temp to perm, are uh, they 1099 trainees? That's really up to the board. The board can decide, um, do they want a full-time training program? Is it a part-time training program? Is it a temp to perm permanent training program? Are these contracted workers for uh, 1099? So this program was built for a need by the board. The idea behind this effort, um, and this effort was actually created uh, by our former chair, uh, Andres Alcantar, um, our current uh, commissioner, uh, Aaron Demerson, and uh, the CEO or executive director of the Texas Economic Development Council, uh, Mr. Schwab. They, they came together to discuss this and they wanted to focus on uh, getting the economic development partners to participate a little bit more. So the idea was that um, they wanted economic development corporations to participate. And we realized that not every community has an economic development corporation. So what we did is we developed a new program called the Texas Industry Partnership Program. And the TIP program actually does a lot of the same thing. Um, it acts in lieu of an economic development corporation, use an industry partner or foundation. Now, with that in mind, the board still makes a decision on whether or not they want to approve a program or not. So if they want to pursue a full-time training program, a part-time training program, a temporary to permanent uh, training program or contracted worker 1099 worker program, that's up to them. If they see a need for it, they can certainly pursue it. Now, next question, is there a cap for each individual receiving a TIP grant? Surprisingly, no, there isn't. We do want a training. We want training to be completed. So let's say you're pursuing an equipment grant and this equipment grant is specific to, um, let's say uh, manufacturing. Uh, you're developing a manufacturing training program at a high school or college or university and you're developing this program and you, you need to have training involved even though you only apply for funds for equipment. We want to know that the equipment was used by trainees and the, the essence of the program under WIOA uh, program funding is if people that would not afford uh, the training due to financial restrictions. So we want to make certain that you're developing a program for people that actually have a need for the training. But as far as a cap uh, individual training, um, there is not. Uh, you know, we'd hope that you're not just training one person. Uh, but more than one and, and hopefully you're seeding or developing a sustainable program. So here's a question for the board, for our industry partners. Can a foundation match multiple projects of 150,000 each from different employers? Now, I'm not sure how that question's read, but I think the essence of that question is, if you're a foundation, um, if there's uh, multiple employers that have uh, $150,000 of projects in different cities, uh, if you're able to, and uh, they apply for those funds with you, can they, can you have multiple projects um, with multiple employers with those matching funds throughout the state? Jeremiah? I'll take that one. Yes, absolutely. Um, we've, we've had multiple projects, I think in, in each of our grant cycles, um, and it doesn't necessarily, the, the amount doesn't matter for for the funder um, as much as it does for, for the recipient. So there's no, no cap there. And what about in you, our, Stephanie? 
and ours would be the same answer, except that, you know, because we are an El Paso Community Foundation, I am unable to do statewide funding. Ours is regional funding, but we can absolutely support multiple partners and, and uh, corporations, industry partners within our region. Perfect. Um, this question's uh, actually, uh, to me, actually, can a small startup business become a partner? It depends. Um, if the board chooses to use a small startup, they can. But I would hope that the business has had some time in the industry that has shown that they have uh, the ability to partner. Um, but the board would still need to make that decision. And, and so let me clarify something here with a, so that we're very clear on this issue. The Texas Workforce Commission does not make a decision on the projects. We do not pursue the project itself. Unless somebody approaches us, we will guide them to the local workforce board and the board will make a decision on whether or not to pursue that project. Um, I'm gonna make very clear on that. Uh, we have very little say on the, on the project itself. Our job is to really provide technical expertise and to make certain that um, it, it fits into the parameters of our program. But for the most part, the board makes that decision. So if they choose to add a small business startup, they can. Hopefully they've, uh, that they'll meet the other requirements that the board may have. Can a business that does, uh, next question. Can a business that does not have a foundation be an applicant for a building and funding its training program in a high skill, high growth occupations within, a permit, within the permitted sectors? So yes. So a foundation or an industry uh, partner, which we would call a business, uh, yes, they can. So uh, technically speaking, uh, Texas Mutual Insurance Company is not a foundation. They're actually a company that puts up funding. Um, so they are uh, a company can participate. And we've had a number of companies participate, small and large companies, uh, sometimes in a consortium, sometimes individually. And what they've done essentially is they put money up to uh, and got matching funds to develop a training program uh, at a college or at a high school. And uh, there's an electric company, uh, Piper Electric, out of a out of a Houston, is looking to develop a program uh, at KD, I believe KDISD. And what they're looking to do is develop a program, an electrician's program. And so they are a private company, and they want to develop this program there. And so they're willing to put up some money and they're probably going to go through Susan and the Gulf Coast uh, board to, to apply for funds to match those funds they're contributing. So, yes. Okay, so uh, we've got a couple of questions left. Um, let's see here. I think, I think, we, uh, are there statewide partnership uh, examples. Um, well, we've not had a statewide partner. We've had regional partners. What we've had is we've had uh, each region that applies, uh, uh, the 28 workforce board regions, they all vary in sizes. Some have multiple counties, some might have just a, a small number, a three or four county uh, region. And in some cases, just a one county region. Those counties or those regions, uh, they work together and they uh, apply for funding um, individually, uh, and they could potentially have a partner like Texas Mutual uh, that offers funding at, at statewide. So we've not had a statewide partner, but each region has applied individually, possibly with a statewide entity. Um, and I, I've got a, a question for Alma. Um, Aurora Geis uh, is asking if you could share the skills gap analysis with them. Um, and where can I get a list of workforce boards uh, in, di in the different regions? And I, I, you can certainly look at our website, Ms. Clark. We do have a uh, website that, that offers that information uh, on our TWC workforce, uh, our Texas Workforce Commission website. Uh, and I guess this is one of the last questions I have. Robert, can the employer contribution for apprentice tuition be considered as a match? It's possible. It's possible, um, but we'd have to work out how that funding is actually uh, contributed. 
So I won't say no, but it would be, uh, it would, we'd have to work out how exactly are you contributing the funds to the, um, to the apprentices. So it's not a no, it's a possibility, yes. And I uh, one from Ann Bartlett, will other industry clusters be considered? I'm interested in, in education, training, library sector, teachers fall under this heading and are identified as high skill, high growth occupations for HGAC or the Houston, um, Houston region. Currently, education, public sector jobs uh, are not included uh, currently, um, but instructor training is included. Uh, if, you're in, if you're training for a particular a job in one of the uh, industry clusters and you're an instructor, there are funds to actually train the trainer for that particular, uh, for that particular training of that particular occupation. So um, in a roundabout way, there is sort of a yes in there, but if you're looking at just teaching training to uh, elementary school teachers, typically we say no. Um, but if they're teaching in a field that's related to one of our industry clusters, it's a possible, it's a possible yes. Um, Mark Duran sent me a question. Um, Robert, we have an economic development corporation in our region that is a public-private partnership. They do not qualify as a, as a high demand job training pro, uh, program partner. Could they be a fund con a contributor to the TIP grant? We've had this question a number of times. Um, it, it really depends. Um, if their uh, completely based uh, funding is uh, industry, it's a possibility. We're getting clarification on chambers. Um, so right now, I do not have an answer for you. This is a possibility. Um, I'll get clarification at the end of this month. I have We have a meeting to actually make some adjustments to our program. So hopefully uh, we'll meet with our partners uh, internally and be able to answer that question. Um, oh, I got a new question. Who would be the best contact to discuss aerospace funding through a partnership between local high school colleges and public agencies? Um, Yvette Broussard, I would say start with your local workforce board. Um, that's where I would start. We are out of time. And I want to make certain that uh, I, I say thank you and uh, to all of our panelists. And I am going to pass this on uh, to our, our director of our department. Thank you. OK, thank you, Robert. And, and thank you to all of our panelists. Um, I hope that you all learned something because you know, I even learned something and I feel like I knew what was going on. So um, it was great to hear their firsthand experience and um, hear, you know, some of the questions that are coming from both our, our board and our industry partners, our foundation partners, um, and have a discussion about that. Um, I know that there had been questions about receiving these slides. You will be sent a copy or a link to the slides um, uh, following the event um, and I believe there will also be a recording posted so look for that and feel free to share it with individuals um, in your network who you know might benefit from this information. So again thank you for joining us um, and if you have additional questions please reach out you can email OEI Texas Industry Partnership at twc.texas.gov um, or you can always give Robert a call, and he is definitely the expert on tip. Um, his phone number is 512-516-0815. Um, and of course, again, thank you to our panelists for making the time for us and for supporting um, their communities. Um, and then certainly thank you to Commissioner Demerson for, for kicking us off today um, and to all of you for attending. So we look forward to partnering with you, with you in the future. Um, and please let us know how we can help you with your project. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Good job. Thank you, everybody.